Hey everybody, Green X here. It's that time of the year. It's foggy, cold, spooky, and the night comes early. The atmosphere is thick, the wind whistles, and as for me, well, I'm in the mood for a classic. So what better time to review a beloved classic horror game than now? Silent Hill 2. A game that I've always wanted to play, but couldn't until recently. Silent Hill is no new topic to this channel. I've used the game's soundtrack in multiple videos of mine, and I'm heavily influenced from it when it comes to composing my projects. So, as you can tell, I kinda like this game. But how much do I like this game? Mm, let's find out. <clears throat> My choices for acquiring this game were limited. Since the HD collection was horrible, and physical PS2 copies costed like, uh, you know, a couple bucks. But now that I'm on PC, I can play the Enhanced Edition, which is objectively the best version of the game. My first ever Silent Hill game was Silent Hill 4 The Room, which, ironically enough, is the most hated game in the mainline franchise. But then again, this is the same community that came up with the foreskin theory, so I... I think I'll pass on that take. I'll be playing this game on the hardest difficulty, so any of my critiques or observations will be based on that specific difficulty setting. Keep this in mind if any parts of my commentary sound inconsistent with your own experience, and also just because this whole game is the definition of subjective. Alright. <sighs> Let's do this. I'm ready for a happy time. Oh. It seems I bought the wrong game. It's no secret that Silent Hill 2 is an emotionally heavy game, and from the press of the start button, it doesn't pull any punches. Immediately, we are given one of the most iconic opening cutscenes in gaming history that is constantly referenced, recreated, and memed. Uh, unfortunately. There is some speculation on why exactly James reacts like this in the opening. Some say it's James trying to keep himself awake from all the restless nights, while others say it's him coming to terms with a world that's disconnecting with him and he's touching his face to discern what is real. I'm here to tell you that they are both wrong. James is composing himself because he just realized he now operates off of tank controls, which then leads to him spending a solid five minutes trying to leave the cleanest restroom in India. Seriously though, first time playing? This uh, took a couple minutes. Hardest boss fight in the game? Dual Shock 2. Go left, go left, go left go left no don't go left god damn it james anyway after leaving the restroom we get introduced to the premise of why james is here in my restless dreams i see that town silent hill Our protagonist is James Sunderland, a seemingly relatable everyday man. Normal clothes, normal hair, normal face. He comes across as an ordinary man, but the recent events in his life are anything but ordinary. James describes how he received a letter from his wife, who's been dead for three years. Ah, of course, I hate it when that happens. Totally jocks the mood for the day. James Sunderland's wife, Mary had died of a disease, and James has been mournful ever since. So it would be understandable for James to be in complete shock to find this letter, written perfectly in her handwriting, with all of its unique curves, and with it, a message. A message that she was waiting. Waiting for him. Waiting in the place most sacred to them both. Waiting. In silence. Silent Hill is special to them. It was a one-time vacation spot where they both fell in love with the town and were brought closer together as lovers. James promised to take her to Silent Hill again one day, but unfortunately, she would pass away. This leads us to the letter. Something about getting a written message from your supposedly deceased wife about her waiting in their special place really makes the hairs on your arms perk up. Is this some sick joke? Is this place haunted? Is she actually alive? Right now, both James and us as the player have no idea. 
So, the only thing we can really do is travel into this wall of fog that covers Silent Hill. Something tells me, however, that there's something off with this town. I don't know if it was the big-ass fortress of fog that told me that, or the shit-smeared restroom. I suppose I'll have time to decide which one on my way in. Whatever, forget about all that. New objective, find wife. Just wife, I, uh... I forgot her name. Alright, let's go. No, not that way, God damn it, dual shock. Now, time for something more exciting. Uh-huh. Well, you know what? That's a good segue. Let's talk about sound design. First thing you'll notice about the menu in this game are the sounds. The sounds. Oh my god. I have no idea how to describe it, but every time I open up the menu in Silent Hill, every time I save my game, this intoxicating feeling comes over me when I hear these addicting sounds. I can't get enough of it. The sound design in this game is absolutely fantastic. I swear to god, this shit is liminal space the video game. I feel nostalgic for something I didn't even grow up with. And I'm barely five minutes into the game. Jesus, give me some popcorn and some fucking TV dinners. I I'm gonna be here a while. With sound effects, of course, comes the saving system. Traditionally, if you want to save, you're gonna have to find these red markers, usually posted up on walls. Touching one of these markers brings up a painfully bright, headache-inducing red screen that then displays a- uh, uh... James? Getting a little close there, huh James? Yeah. Something tells me I'm not going to be saving that much. Moving on, James gets into a graveyard, because of course he does, and meets Angela. Naturally, sound design also includes voice acting. So, how's the voice acting? I'm looking for... someone. I'm looking for my mama. I, I mean my mother. Pretty good. Now, I'm not joking, the voice acting in this game really is good, but this is the worst scene in the game performance-wise, and first impressions are very important. It is really fucking funny, though. Aren't you looking for someone? That's right. Only thing we get out of Angela is that she's looking for her mother and potentially her father and brother, but she's had no luck so far. She tells us about Silent Hill and then lets us off with a warning, and James is all like, talk to the hand, bitch. And then skedaddles. After a lot of walking, we finally make it into Silent Hill. Wow. Could have picked a better fucking place. This makes Detroit look elegant. I only got one question. Did it always look like this? I mean, Really, James? This is your guys' special place? Let me tell you, you could have fooled me. Very easily. Why here? Why couldn't it be, I don't know, San Francisco? Actually, you know what? I take that back. That place might actually be worse. I can only imagine the advertisements for this place. Come on over to Silent Hill, where the weather is beautiful and clear, a welcoming environment, a warm atmosphere, and cute, friendly animals. Don't worry, they don't bite. Duh. Uh, I think. Look, they even stand up. What the fuck is that? You know what? This place is starting to grow on me. I mean, aside from the residents looking a little sickly, it's kind of beautiful. The attention to detail on these streets is immaculate. James gets inside this little tunnel and finds this mini radio making a ton of noise. And then... Prometheus! The boss fight. Let's do this shit, James. What? Is it dead? God fucking damn, James, holy shit. Oh yeah, that reminds me. Quick backstory on James. He used to be a jock in his high school years. Combine that with a constant running around and fighting random libido monsters, and it's not completely ruled out that James, underneath all of that goodwill drip, is buff and shredded as fuck. I'm getting sidetracked though. Let's get the fuck out of here. Oh yeah. This thing broken? What the? You know what? I've had my doubts, but I think I finally come to the conclusion that this game is kind of creepy. I better take it anyway. I might need it. It is that a dead body? Oh my God! Who would do such a thing? Ooh, a key on the ground. 
Ow, fuck! James gets the key to the Woodside Apartments Hotel, and then decides to book a reservation. Because fuck this town. Hey, this guy hasn't slept in like, three days. Can you really blame him? Nah, I can. No rest for the wicked, James. After a bit of extensive exploring, James gets onto the second floor of the hotel, and then he finds- Ooh, a key on the ground. Oh, come on. Mm. Ah, fuck! I'm starting to see a pattern here. <laughs> hey, wait! <laughs> that little rascal. <laughs> Next time she sees me, I'm going to have a gun. The current objective is to get to the park lake, since that's where Mary is suspected to be. Now, the details on why we're forced to go through this musty-ass hotel are kind of lost on me. I guess you could say it's because the roads have caved in and multiple paths are blocked off, but honestly, I think it's just an excuse for the game to petrify all the claustrophobic gamers in the back, because this place is horrifying. The sound design doesn't stop either. Some rooms have their own unique track to give a different variant of the atmosphere. It gets so much sometimes that you might find yourself booking it out of the room once you get what you need, despite there being no monsters in there. It's actually impressive how the designers managed to pull this off. The walls sound like they're breathing down your neck. This entire district feels like it has its own beating heart that reacts to whatever you do inside of it. Which really makes you question why James is so reckless, putting his hands on everything and... inside... everything. Oh, nice. A clockwork key. Don't know if it was worth violating myself for it, but you take what you can get. What the fuck is that? Uh... <sighs> yeah. I'm good. Come on, come on. Fuck! Alright, fine. Back to Silent Hill. What? Where the fuck did he go? There's puzzles in this game as well, as one might expect. Which, honestly, is a huge turnoff to me, usually. Quick history lesson on me. I'm not very smart. So puzzles are something I've grown to hate as a man. This is actually why I've always despised horror games, because most of them always figure out a way to put these obnoxious IQ checks that ruin the pacing of the game. This one isn't too bad though. I got stuck for a bit, but I finally found out where I'm supposed to- What the fuck? You know, you'd think my wife would pick a better vacation spot, like Veneto, Italy, or Paris, France, and not Butt Rape Central. Oh look, James is getting into the closet. I feel a very unoriginal joke coming along. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. He's coming. James, shoot the fucking gun! Why are you smiling like you just popped shit? You didn't do anything to him. Your aim is trash. At least he left. Oh, God. Damn. <laughs> Uh, my turn? Nah, I'm joking. We stumble into a room with a dead body lying next to a refrigerator. James hears a noise coming from the bathroom, so he moves in to investigate. Big mistake, because now we get the biggest jump scare in the game. Ass crack! Oh, by the way, meet Eddie. He's a pretty funny guy. I didn't do it. I swear I didn't kill anybody. His voice acting is atrocious. But it's also really good. There's just a lot of personality to the deliveries. The uncanny way they converse just adds to the feeling that everything you see here in Silent Hill is just a very lucid dream. An autistic one, too. What did you eat? Uh, uh, Domino's cheesy bread. Oh god! Eddie, you're going to die! Eddie insists that he didn't kill anyone, referring to the dead guy we just saw. Do I believe him? No, not really. But honestly, anyone who's stupid enough to enter this bullshit town can get whatever's coming to them. So, as far as I'm concerned, good fucking riddance. Eddie, you did good. He wishes us good luck, and we head out. After a bit more exploring, we enter a room and find... Angela, the girl from the graveyard. And she's... laying there. In front of a mirror. When talking to her, it becomes apparent that something is off. She seems defeated, lifeless, and much more bitter than she was before. It's easier just to run. Besides, is what we deserve. Something that many people pick up on is that she's weirdly apologetic for no reason, constantly excusing herself when talking, like she's doing something wrong and anticipating some sort of punishment. It's very obvious from the get-go that Angela has a very dark past that she is trying to lay to rest. She asks us to carry the knife for her, since she is at a point where she can't even trust herself with it. So, James reaches out to grab it and then- Oh, Jesus. Be bad. Please don't. 
woman moment. Oh, hey, look, a coin. We get into this room that has a pretty chilling environment that contains a key, unlocking the exit out of this hotel. This room is one of the most memorable parts of the game for me, despite it being pretty insignificant. Fun fact about this room, it has a pretty rare Easter egg that plays a clip of audio that makes you question your sanity when you first hear it. Apparently, the audio source comes from James himself, since you can actually see him moving his lips as he mutters it. I wasn't able to get footage of this, though, so who knows. Many speculate what the whispering is saying. Some say that it's, see my dead wife, come home, do some laundry, do some. And others say that it's, give me sucky sucky, give some more, might come a bit. <laughs> yeah, the, the Silent Hill community is a bunch of fucking retards. My interpretation is that this was a random line of mumbling that they added in last second to drive a select few players crazy. Nothing much deeper than that. But the theories are still nice. It's the little things like this that make the game so replayable. I remember when I first heard this easter egg, I genuinely thought I was hearing things. It drove me fucking crazy. Man, give me that key. Give me the fuck out this scary ass place. I love this game. I really do. What? Never mind, I don't love this game. What the fuck is that? The fucking door, James. It's locked. All those keys in your inventory, and you can't even open this fucking door. And I'm stuck with your aim. Oh yeah, we're fucked. Please don't kill me, I'm sorry, I- What? Where's he going? We're not done yet. Yeah, you better run. Pussy. Uh oh shit. I can't believe I'm saying this, but... I'm actually happy to see the fog again. Worst hotel stay ever. I used Trivago once, and this is where it takes me. After leaving the hell tell, we run into a little girl named Laura. Wait, that's that kid. Now's your chance, James. Shoot her. You. God damn it, James. Stop being so diplomatic. What's a little girl like you doing here anyway? Huh? Are you blind or something? No, he's not. He can see just fine. Prove her wrong, James. Take aim and shoot. The best thing about Laura is, surprisingly, her voice acting. It may not sound all that impressive to the average ear, but when you consider that Jacqueline was eight years old when she voiced this character, yeah, that's pretty amazing. Especially knowing how hard it is to get a child to deliver a good line of dialogue. So, in terms of child acting, this is definitely up there. You didn't love Mary anyway. Wait! How do you know Mary's name? We finally make it to the park. If James's assumption is right, we should see Mary. No, you're not Mary. Holy oh, shit, you're hot. Let's talk about Maria. Maria is a very interesting character. To this day, even after many playthroughs, people are still slightly confused about who exactly Maria is. For the extra perceptive in the audience, you might have noticed that there are two scenarios for Silent Hill 2. Letter from Silent Heaven and born from a wish. The latter is Maria's own sub-campaign, a prequel to the main scenario, setting up both Maria and James' characters. The sub-scenario does a good job describing Maria's backstory while still keeping her ambiguous. That being said, it does lightly spoil the game, so I am purposefully leaving out certain details until the time is appropriate, at which point I'll refer back to the DLC. It tells a very interesting narrative of Maria and shows her desperation to, in lack of better words, not be alone. Especially not in this town, I mean, god damn. Out of desperation for human contact, she ends up in a mansion downtown, and gets wrapped up in a mini-mystery involving the person who lives there. It's not very complex, but it's written well enough to the point where it sticks with you after finishing it, and adds a lot of depth to not only Maria, but the town of Silent Hill. As for the sub-scenario as a whole, it's very good. It's short, with an awesome puzzle, a new environment to get petrified in, and a couple new tracks by Akira, one of which is an absolute fucking baner. Terror in the Depths of the Fog. I use it in my videos a lot. It's fucking great. By the end of the sub-scenario, Maria ends up at Rosewater Park. This circles back to where we're at now. James describes Mary and why he is in the town looking for her. Maria says she hasn't seen her here, and asks if James had any other place that him and Mary visited. This is when James recalls the place they stayed at during their visit. The Lakeview Hotel. Maria interjects and claims she knows the place, and says that it's still there, open and running. Maria offers to tag along on our adventures, and by offer, I mean... Please don't leave me alone in this shithole. And James is all like, all right, fine. Now we got a duo. It's like the Batman and Robin of nutcases. James goes down a path that leads them to a bowling alley. Maria stays outside because she hates fun. My type of girl. We walk inside and find both Eddie and Laura together. Huh. 
You're just a gutless fat, though. Jesus Christ, someone is raising that kid right. We also hear this line that catches our attention. Did you find the lady you're looking for? What's her name? Mary? So, the kid not only knows Mary, but is looking for her. Alright, fine, maybe we don't shoot her. Uh, for now. Let's see if we can get some information out of... Oh. The music is so fucking good, I, I can't take it anymore. Akira had a wild sense of humor, making these tense songs that have percussion that sounds like they are infesting your skin, and these laid-back lo-fi tracks that were created before lo-fi even became a popular thing. Alright, let's see what the fuss is all about with these two. Are you alone here, Eddie? Uh, no. Great voice acting. This town is full of big booty Latinas. How can you sit there and eat pizza? A uh, guy that wasn't a part of the script. Forget you. Ah, shit, there she goes again. Gotta go, Eddie. See you later. Both James and Maria chase Laura through Heaven's Night, and then it's a Brookhaven Hospital, which is fucking horrifying. Why did she go in here out of all places? Brookhaven Hospital has got to be one of my favorite parts of the game. It's a desolate building with rusty interiors and great attention to detail that makes it look like the place was inhabited 50 years ago. This is probably one of the hardest sections in the game, not just in difficulty, but also in its backstory. One of my favorite things about Silent Hill is its environmental storytelling, and some of the best examples of it can be found within this very hospital. You have this section in your inventory called Memos. It's basically a tab that keeps track of anything you've read throughout your playthrough, and there's a lot of interesting memos in this game. However, my absolute favorite memo in the game can be found in this room, and it's one of the simplest yet most nuanced pieces of commentary I have seen from a video game. One that you can just skim through on your first playthrough. It's a short one, so I'll just read it to you real quick. Maybe you can tell me what you think in the comments. It's an interesting perspective. The potential for this illness exists in all people, and under the right circumstances, any man or woman would be driven, like him, to the other side. The other side, perhaps, may not be the best way to phrase it. After all, there is no wall between here and there. It lies on the borders where reality and unreality intersect. It is a place both close and distant. Some say it isn't even an illness. Well, I cannot agree with them. I'm a doctor, not a philosopher, or even a psychiatrist. But sometimes I have to ask myself this question. It's true that to us, his imaginings are nothing but the inventions of a busy mind, but to him, there simply is no other reality. Furthermore, he is happy there. So, why, I ask myself, why in the name of healing him must we drag him painfully into the world of our own reality? Something else is written by hand. I got the key from Joseph. It's probably the key to the box. Ha, oh, hell yeah. Give me that. That's raid boss tier loot. We step into a room and Maria calls for a small break. Usually I would have some pushback towards the idea of leaving a woman by herself in a place like this, but <laughs> not this time. See ya, Maria. Oh shit, get me back in there, give me- As most of you know, when you're not smacking down lap dancing monsters with a 4x4, you'll be completing puzzles. A lot of these puzzles include combining unique items together in order to progress. So, if you're ever stuck, try to think about what you got. Like this big can of juice, for example. What do you do with a big can of juice? Well, what you need to do is that you- Well, I mean, obviously, dumbass. What else would you do with it? Drink it? In this town? Preposterous. However, these puzzles can get ridiculous sometimes. Not like they're complicated or difficult or anything, just- really weird. Take this puzzle for example. We find this case with a bunch of locks all over it, so we need to find the keys and codes to all of them. We crack the code lock, use the lapis key, use the purple bull key, and then spend a solid five minutes trying to figure out the padlock code. Then, once we crack that, we open the case and find a strand of hair. But wait, if I'm losing you, don't worry. I'm about to leave you fucking stranded. He takes the hairpiece, connects it to this hook, and then uses it to fish out this key, which he then uses to unlock an elevator. Holy shit. Holy shit. That has got to be the stupidest fucking puzzle I have ever seen in my entire life. I absolutely adore this game. Compare this to other PS2 games at the time with puzzles. What we got? MGS2? <laughs> What else? The original God of War? <sighs> oh my fucking god, that game.
game was very good. Anyway, back to good game. James takes the elevator down and enters a room where he runs into Laura, unfortunately. Laura, get out of there. Shut the fuck up! As it turns out, Laura does know Mary. She seems to have a close connection with her and has known her for about a year. Wait, what? Didn't she- you know what? Never mind. Let's get her out of here. Wait, I forgot something. Not now, Laura. It's important. Laura, we need to go- Big booty Latina! What? Ah, of course. Every white man's bait. I don't see the issue in it, though. I trust Laura. I retract my statement. Why does this room smell like foreskin cheese? Oh. That's why. Laura, open the, open the door. Open the door, please. May Can you kindly you open the door. Laura, open, open the, the door. door. I'm gonna fucking kill you when I get out of here! Well, shit. Stop. Let's talk about the monster design for a minute. Up until now, I've tried to act like these monsters don't phase me and everything is normal. But I think this is the moment the game broke me. A bed that is stuck to the ceiling that picks you up with its dangling feet and sucks the life out of you. It doesn't even fall from the ceiling when you kill it. It just shrivels up. What the fuck is this boss fight? There's only two people on this planet who are capable of coming up with this shit. Masahiro Ito and John Wayne Gacy. Actually, I take that back. Just Masahiro Ito. This guy is fucking insane. When one of the simplest monsters in the game is a pair of legs with an upper torso that is also a pair of legs, then that's when you know Shit is fucked over here, although still slightly less fucked than Detroit, and slightly more fucked than Iraq. It really makes you question why these monsters look the way they do. This definitely isn't another case of monster design shit posting. There's definitely a pattern to these guys. Anyway, we beat the boss, and then we... Wh what? James. What? James. What the hell is that? I swear to god, this game is on a different type of drug. Everything looks... different now. The hospital is somehow even more decayed than it was before. Everything is worn and rusted to an almost hellish degree. Damn. Am I going crazy? My save games tell me otherwise. Hospital alternative. Yeah, that's one way of putting it. Alright, let's get- Jesus Christ, you scary bitch! Oh shit, I guess we did leave her in that one room, huh? Uh huh. Whoops. Needless to say, Maria is very happy to see us. Anyway! What do you mean, anyway? All you care about is that dead wife of yours. I've never been so scared in my whole life! This is the scariest cutscene I've seen yet. And to think these FMV cutscenes were all made by one man. You gotta keep in mind, this is the early, early 2000s, so technology wasn't even popping that much. It has this balance between hyper-realism and uncanny territory. Doesn't help that the voice acting is great, too. The voice acting was making me laugh in the beginning, now it's making me shit my pants. Yeah, ain't nothing funny over here, white boy. We in the Bronx now. Something I noticed when I first played is that Maria is very protective of Laura. I guess James also is to an extent, but Maria really seems to care about her. This also happens in her sub-scenario. Maria just randomly mentions Laura out of the blue. She doesn't really know why, either. She says she doesn't even know her. I'm beginning to think that these two have a very severe case of amnesia. In fact, I'm starting to think everyone has that. Everyone seems so forgetful and lethargic. I used to think it was just bad voice acting. No. This is something different. James always insisting he isn't crazy, Angela having these weird freakouts and mood swings, Maria always having this weird insight and being unnecessarily cleany. This game is weird. This game is really weird. We push on, though, and do exciting things, like opening this freezer and whatever the fuck this is. After a little more pushing, we finally arrive at the climax of this chapter. Here we are, finally. I finally have something bad to say. This is the worst part of the fucking game. Pyramid had picked the most inconvenient time to show up, so now you gotta make it to this elevator with Maria. That's right, you're supposed to book it across these linear ass hallways and make it all the way to the end while also making sure Maria doesn't die. So, basically, a chase scene mixed in with an escort mission. Wow, that sounds like so much fun. I was being sarcastic, this shit sucks. What is with Konami and escort missions, I swear to god. At least Raiden's was funny. This isn't funny at all. A horror game is supposed to scare me, not piss me off. She dies fast during this section. She'll take like two and a half hits 
and then just fall to her knees. I think your success at this section varies on your difficulty, but as soon as you crank that bitch up to hard, you won't even get five good steps in without hearing Maria's death mp3 file. No. What you need to do is awkwardly walk back and shoot Pyramid Head in order to slow him down. And Maria's AI isn't exactly a free thinker, so you can't really expect her to move along without you. You have to guide her. This lethal combination leads to some pretty killer heart palpitations, as I scream at my monitor the following words. You stupid bitch, get inside of the elevator. I've replayed this part so many fucking times. Please just let me get there. Holy shit, I'm gonna make it. We made it! Maria, get in the fucking elevator. Come on, we're right there. Get in the elevator, get in! Get in the fucking elevator! Well... Shit. Hi. My name is Joseph Thorne. Are you seeking an escape? To build memories with your loved ones? To indulge yourself in one of many favorite American pastimes? Drinking beer, watching football, beating your wife, playing disc golf, beating your wife and then playing disc golf. Ladies and gentlemen, the possibilities are endless. If you said yes to any of those questions, well, I got the perfect little town for you. It's a little town that goes by the name of Silent Hill. Let's get renowned journalist and writer of the official Silent Hill sightseeing brochure, Roger Widmark, on the call to sell you on this beautiful little town. Roger. Hi, Joseph. Hello, Roger. Would you mind describing one of the many sites you can visit in Silent Hill? Something wholesome for the whole family. Well, you see, Joseph, Silent Hill is like a woman with a rough exterior that has more to show. On the outside, she's beaten and battered, but on the inside, she has a yeast infection. Silent Hill on the outside is bland and bare, but when you give it a chance, you'll quickly realize it has much more to offer, like a cheap strip club and tap water that's more polluted than Flint, Michigan. Basically, this town is a fucking shithole. Get him off the call. Heaven's Night, a gentleman club for the gentle souls. Lakeview Motel for the sleep deprived seeking refuge. And of course, Neely's Bar for all the wife beaters wearing wife beaters. Whew. <laughs> uh, feisty one, isn't it? If you're still not sold on this beautiful little town, let me ask you something. Would you rather visit France where even the middle class must resort to defecating on the streets? Or Silent Hill? Where the residents welcome you with open arms and local gods welcome you with open caskets. Ladies and gentlemen, I rest my case. And therefore, my heart to all of you. Good night. Um, I think that was the, uh, the, uh, I, I don't know what that was, actually. We should get out of here. Get, get this off of me. Get this the fuck off of me. In my restless dreams, I see that town, Silent Hill. You promised you'd take me there again someday, but you never did. Well, I'm alone there now, in our special place waiting for you. Waiting for you to come to see me. But you never do. This is probably the peak of Silent Hill 2's melancholy, if that's the best way to put it. You went through the hospital with Maria, even though it was still creepy. You still had someone. Now, you don't have anyone. You're alone in this abandoned hospital, with no noise, no monsters, just a distant piano.
Well, time to leave. No rest for the wicked. Before dipping out of this whack-ass hospital, we find this map with a note directing us to a letter and a wrench, with a short little quote attached. He who is not bold enough to be stared at from across the abyss is not bold enough to stare into it himself. Yeah, uh, I've had enough philosophical bullshit for the day. Let's get out of here. Silent Hill at nighttime. It's about as terrifying as you'd expect it to be. Yeah, who would have known? Getting lost in an abandoned town at the peak of Nocturne is not all it's cracked up to be. The atmosphere is thick this part of the game. It's a fan favorite section, and I see why. This entire part feels like a nightmare I would have as a seven-year-old. Some of the most significant memos relating to James and his dynamic with Silent Hill can be found here. Like this one in Neely's Bar, where the town just goes full-on LTG and tells James to kill himself. Ugh, based as fuck. Kids today could never survive a second in Silent Hill lobbies. When you're at the lowest point in your life, you can always count on your own town to tell you to consider the rope. It's like you've got six main characters in this game. James, Mary, Laura, Eddie, Angela, and Silent Hill. Silent Hill is an asshole. Fuck this guy. We also have another personal favorite memo of mine that you can find in this town. It's a dead body lying next to a series of notes he has written down. He describes these demons he has been seen, mentioning one that cannibalizes humans. Eh, well, we definitely haven't seen anything like that. The notes continue, and it seems he's actually learned more about these monsters. He says they're attracted to light and are sensitive to sound, so if you want to sneak past them, you'd have to turn off your flashlight. Yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing that. We follow the notes until we pick up the last one that gives the most helpful tip out of all the notes. <clears throat> Run away. Well, that's pretty terrifying. About the tips he gave in his notes, I found it all to be very interesting. You might think this is all narrative fluff, but it's not. I tested it. Technically speaking, turning off the radio and your flashlight will make it easier for you to sneak past the monsters, or just not having them chase you. This is an actual method you can utilize. It's not that useful, and no matter what difficulty you're playing on, you will never get this desperate, but it's so fucking cool. It's not just good attention to detail, it's the way that it's explained that makes it so memorable. Instead of getting hints from the loading screens, you get actual insight into the world from someone else's research. Something that can actually help you, as opposed to some boring-ass codex you'd find. That is badass. Peak game design. We find a note on someone's porch, talking about the old society and needing a key to it. To get the key, we need to dig up an old box buried beneath the ground near a praying statue and open it with a wrench. The memo itself is very strange. It's like it begins mid-sentence. It comes across as a note to self until it directly mentions James. If you still do not wish to stop, James. I pray to the Lord to have mercy on your eternal soul. Alright, I'm being punked. Where's the cameras? Mary, come out. Alright, fine. I've come this far. Might as well see it through. Because the gayest thing a YouTuber could ever do is make a part two to a video series. The Silent Hill Historical Society Museum. Here I come. Here we are. This place... Uh, looks like shit. As you might expect in a museum, it has many respectable and breathtaking art pieces that you can observe for your own pleasure. Like this one. Ah, of course. Man-made horrors beyond my comprehension. My favorite piece, right up there with the Mona Lisa. We see another beautiful art piece called a fucking hole in the wall. So we do the reasonable thing and decide to descend down its steps. This was the point in the game where I started frequently looking over my shoulder while playing. Ah, here we are. My favorite location. A fucking hole in the ground. Or, as Silent Hill theorists like to call it, Mary's Vagina. I'm not joking, by the way. That is an actual theory. Incomprehensible retardation. Yeah, quick piece of advice. If you ever plan to play Silent Hill, just play the games and don't look at the wikis. Save yourself the autism. It will actually make the games worse in retrospect. The hole has an endless depth to it. So, naturally, we're presented with a prompt. Will you jump down? Wow, James. You've really fucking lost it, haven't you? This is it. We've truly passed the point of no return. This is where shit gets crazy. Alright, fine. Go ahead. As we explore this new area, it becomes quickly apparent that this isn't a museum anymore. In fact, it's actually a prison, Toluca Prison, which we read about in some of the memos we pick up. It's a place notorious for executions, which makes sense since the origins of this prison can be traced back to it being a prison camp for POWs. Now, whether this place is haunted from the amount of death row sentencing, I can't say, but I'm pretty sure that not even the most lucid spirits can make this place inverted. What the fuck am I looking at? Will you jump down again? God damn, how many times are we gonna try and kill ourselves? Who's that? 
Eddie? Killing a person ain't no big deal. I agree. Don't worry, Mira. I've fought Pyramid Head before. Watch this godlike aim, bitch. Uh-oh. Uh Just put the gun to their head. Pow. Eddie, you're not gonna go and kill someone, are you? Tia. The fuck was that? Well, good to know that my best friend is having a good time at least. This prison is wicked. Makes the hospital look cozy in comparison. There's even some sense of occultist worshipping going on, with symbolism relating to resurrections and living beings. Some evil Buddha shit. There were legitimately certain parts here that creeped me the fuck out. Still, not as scary as the fact that there is another stupid fucking item puzzle that's probably even worse than the last one. Yeah, there's your jump scare. But I'm not gonna waste another goddamn section on it. So, just look at this. A wax doll with a lighter and a horseshoe. Combine. What do you get? You get to open this hatch. I... I am fucking losing it right now. Let's just go. I gotta be honest, at first, I didn't really know how to feel about this section, but on subsequent playthroughs, I made up my mind. I love this part of the game. It has some really cool fucking puzzles, and they're not too complicated. They just have some pretty creative concepts that builds upon the lore of the prison, and also contributes to the ongoing Silent Hill exclusive effort of fucking with the player's head. And it's pretty sick. Oh my god, look who it is. Mary, I mean Maria. James, honey, did something happen to you? After we got separated in that long hallway? Yeah, I guess what we saw back there was a hallucination. Or she just got resurrected. I don't know. Look, guys, believe it or not, this is actually one of the less stranger things I've seen in this town. It doesn't matter who I am. I'm here for you, James. See? I'm real. Yes, I'm a simp. Clinically depressed. Come and get me. I can't do anything. Stay right there. I'll be there soon. Ah, of course. My favorite food topping. Pussy whip. Alright, let's go get her. We hear a familiar voice. Angela. And she's screaming. So, we quickly move in. And, uh... <laughs> Of course. Man-made horrors beyond my comprehension. This is a prime textbook example of Silent Hill symbolism. Angela is a very tragic character. She is a woman that has had a traumatic childhood, with a family that would constantly abuse her. Especially her father. And, if it's not obvious by this point, Angela is a victim of sexual assault. The symbolism, boss design, and even the room layout reinforces this point. The bed that you're fighting, with the two figures struggling underneath the rusted sheets, and the cylinders moving in and out of the walls... Yeah, this is definitely a very hard part of the game to stomach. Angela. Relax. Don't order me around! I'm not trying to order you. You said your wife Mary was dead, right? I know about you. You didn't want her around anymore. You probably found someone else. What's your relationship like with your father? That's ridiculous. I never... Man, forget about her, James. Sure, you might be socially awkward, hard to talk to, and an alcoholic, but, uh, you know what? Just forget about her. Let's go get Maria. Can't believe I'm saying this, but I've actually missed- You've got to be fucking kidding me. Mary. Right. I guess we did come here for Mary. We walk into a room filled with graves. We see different tombstones with inscribed names, such as Maria M. K. and Walter Sullivan. Most of them are all filled up, with the exception of three. Angela Orozco, Eddie Dombrowski, and James Sunderland. Both Angela and Eddie's graves are filled up halfway, insinuating that their stories are nearly at an end. 
but James's grave is empty. It's a depthless hole. It's obvious even at this point. Eddie and Angela are on a one-way track. We've seen them. They're completely losing their minds. But James? His grave isn't dug yet. There's going to be multiple outcomes to this situation, and the town is still deciding your fate. We have time, but not much. Oh, and by the way, front flip into the hole, of course, you all know the drill, come on. Oh. It's like we're in our dreams. Nightmares, uh, specifically. We make it down the creepy-ass hallway, and we find... Uh-oh. Eddie! How are you? Still standing on business, I see. Ain't no fucking with 44 Dombrowski. From now on, if anyone makes fun of me, I'll kill him! Just like that. Eddie, have you gone nuts? James, that was the worst possible thing you could have said to someone with a firearm. I don't mean this lightly. You are a fucking dumbass. And that's why I love you. Ow, fuck! God damn it, watch this rip post. Oh. That was easy. Eddie is a character overlooked by a lot of people, mostly being remembered because of the memes, which isn't the worst way to go out. That voice acting is fire. But Eddie really is a well-written character, and speaks a lot to the newer generation we have right now. Eddie is tortured by his insecurities, and this is what leads to a spiral into insanity. Themes of perfect body imaging and bullying encompass his character. It seems all he ever knew throughout his life was bullies, so when he sees someone like James criticizing him, trying to bring him back down to Earth, he loses it. A wise man once said, The scariest thing on the planet is a virgin with a gun. Alright. Let's go get him. This fight is a lot more significant than it may first appear. You gotta understand, James has only been killing monsters up until this point. This was established early on, but not emphasized. You have to put it in perspective. We are fighting a real person. The morality involving monsters is subjective, but not with Eddie. The stakes are different this time. You think it's okay to kill people? You need help, Eddie. Don't get a holy on me, James! This town called you too! You and me are the same! We're not like other people! Eddie's boss fight is surprisingly hard. Don't get me wrong, it's still easy. But unlike the monsters we fought where they just kinda stay in one place, sometimes slouching over to you if they get pissed off, he actively chases you around. Did he? Did he just put his hands on my jacket? Does he know how much this thing costs? Get your fucking grubby hands off of me, get- Uh-oh. Eddie? I thought I had it on safety. I killed a... a human being. Damn, listen to that reaction. Is this what Kane said after killing Abel? Mary. Did you really die three years ago? At this point, James begins to question himself. More than usual, Mary has been dead for three years, but Laura said she met her a year ago, and James keeps getting distracted from Maria, making this question why we're even in Silent Hill. The whole reason why we came here in the first place was because of the letter. Is there someone toying with us? Maybe Laura? Angela? I don't know. You can examine these items in your inventory, such as the photo of Mary and her letter, and they can affect certain things in the game. I would take a look at the letter every now and then, but after Eddie, something strange happened. I opened the letter, and it, it doesn't say anything. Wait, it doesn't say anything? The fuck? Motherfuckers done took my wife's text. Wiggas can't have shit in Silent Hill. What the hell is going on here? I. Ooh, a boat minigame! Time to get distracted again. We finally made it. Lakeview Hotel. This place hasn't changed at all in three years. Really? Not at all? Yeah, okay. We walk into the hotel, pick up the map, and we see... a message waiting for you. Room 312 where James and Mary stayed. Well, at least we know where to go now. Better start exploring this place and see what we- Ooh, a key on the table. Give me that. Oh man, we're already getting- Oh, Jesus Christ! What? What the fuck? Is that- Laura, you fucking bitch. You know how many bullets I wasted on those monsters? 
All of them. I would kill you, but unfortunately, I'm all out of bullets. Laura is also here looking for Mary. She asks how our search is going, but so far, we've had no luck. Confused, Laura would mention a letter that she was given to by Mary herself. She gives it to James, and it's quite the read. In this letter, Mary talks about James, describing him as surely and quiet, but a sweet man. Which is, yeah, I'd say that's accurate. Also a fucking dumbass, but we gotta keep it PG. In all seriousness, this letter is heartbreaking. Almost brought a tear out of me when I first read it. It's a goodbye letter to Laura, saying that she's away in a beautiful place now. She tells Laura that she loves her, and that if things were different, she would have adopted her as her own daughter. She ends the letter by congratulating her on her eighth birthday. Huh. Well, time for the most important question there is. Laura, how old are you? Um, I turned eight last week. There we have it. It's confirmed beyond a shadow of a doubt that Mary couldn't have died three years ago. Now we just need to figure out if she's actually dead or not. Laura says Mary also left James a letter, which of course provokes a reaction. Something around the lines of, What? And she runs off. Get back here, you little shit. Oh, excuse me, you were a boss? At least we have a clear set objective now. We need to get into that room. Maria, before she died, again, mentioned something very strange. She started going on a tangent about how she wasn't your Mary, yet she started talking like her. She brings up a videotape they left at Lakeview, and wouldn't you know it, it's still here. Now we just need to get into room 312, and we'll have some answers. The only problem is, the path is blocked off by a gate. Of course, because everyone just loves locking everything. This isn't an accurate depiction of American culture, you know. Everyone here always leaves their front doors unlocked. Uh, don't ask how I know. What the fuck? This is definitely one of the more unique sections of the game. It has a lot of variety in its design. You got a hotel lobby that naturally connects into claustrophobic hallways filled with monsters, a few select rooms that have a pretty unsettling atmosphere to them, and an employee elevator that leads you down into a lower part of the building that has a chill-ass bar and some pretty nice-looking rooms. Like this one. Damn. Give me a PS3 and a mini-fridge full of junk food, and I'll happily stay here. It has a very unique vibe to it that I can't explain. It's very lonely and creepy, but also comforting at the same time. I wouldn't mind having an entire Silent Hill game dedicated to a room like this. Oh well, maybe one day. Oh, and by the way, when you get down here, make sure you grab this music box. Very important, and also very easy to miss. And when you miss it, you miss it hard. That is a fat backtrack. Basically, these music boxes are a part of a puzzle that you need to do in order to get the key you need to proceed upstairs, which is where room 312 is. You're supposed to find and collect all three music boxes and then fit them into these slots. Put them in the correct order and you get... A fire-ass tune. Akira really flexing his mixtape skills here. About to burn the hotel down with that time signature. We got the key. Now it's time to head up. I just want to say real quickly, everything in this game in terms of level design has been almost perfect. It's really hard for me to choose my favorite part, but if I had a gun to my head, I would probably have to say it's a tie between Brookhaven Hospital and Lakeview Hotel. I'm probably leaning more towards Brookhaven Hospital since it has so many memos and much more lore jam-packed into it. The Lakeview Hotel in comparison is really empty, but it makes up for it with some pretty looking set pieces, and it's still one of my favorite parts of the game. We unlock the gate, make our way through the hallway, and enter room 312. And... no one's here. I guess I didn't know what I was expecting. I was kind of expecting to see Maria here at least, but we don't even have that. It's just an empty room. Well, we still have the tape at least, so it's not like the trip was for nothing. This is it. James and Mary's special place. I gotta be honest, it... It doesn't look that bad. I guess I wouldn't mind staying here either. It's better than the place I had to stay at in Morgantown, at least. Alright, that's enough stalling. We're finally here. The end of the game. Jesus, it feels like I've been here for 20 hours. Alright, let's see what's in this tape. God, a VHS? Can't remember the last time I've seen one of these. I don't even think I remember how to work this.
Are you taping again? Come on. <sighs> I don't know why, but I just love it here. It's so peaceful. You know what I heard? This whole area used to be a sacred place. I think I can see why. It's too bad we have to leave. Please promise you'll take me again, James. God. That was rough. This may be an obvious twist to some of you now, but when we all first played Silent Hill 2, this was an absolute haymaker. It's such a roller coaster of emotions. You feel sadness, anger, disgust, and regret all clumped up into one distorted image that you're forced to look at and come to grips with. Why would James do such a thing? Was he trying to end her suffering? We saw her bedridden in the video, she looked incapable of doing anything. Or... Is this all just... an excuse? Oh, James... What have you done? Laura, you're on time! Unfortunately. And... I really do mean it this time. We break the news to Laura. And she doesn't make it easy. James doesn't do anything. He just lets her yell at him. He knows he deserves every bit of it. We saw in the letter how much Mary loved Laura. So seeing this scene with that context is what makes it so heartbreaking. And it's also what makes this line in particular so powerful to me. Laura, I'm sorry. James understands how much Mary meant to her. And he understands how much pain he's caused. But he can't do anything now. Well... What do we do now? That voice! Well, I'll be damned. Alright, James. What do you say? One more road to cross. No rest for the wicked. So, James killed his wife. I would try to insert some stupid one-liners such as based trad husband, but it's getting kind of hard for me to meme at this point. At the same time James starts to lose his grip on reality, I start to lose mine. James Sunderland, you are literally me. The hotel, as you can see, is completely different now. Everything is decayed like before in the hospital. Most people would call this part the other world in Silent Hill. I... I don't know. This is the other world, huh? The question is, 
which one is rooted in reality? Because as far as I'm concerned, this story has done nothing but lie to us. I don't know. It seems anytime this game gives an answer, it gives two more questions for you to think about. Exploring this version of the hotel is probably one of the most unsettling parts of the game. The sound design is perfect. The song Blank Fairy gives a new sense of eeriness to the situation. Like you just discovered something that destroyed the foundations of your life. This is the moment where everything breaks down, and the soundtrack reflects that. It sounds like Akira just died midway into producing. And even putting all that aside, the hotel just looks terrifying now. The interiors are decayed and soaked, everything is riddled with dirt and rust, and as you progress through the building, mold starts encrusting the walls and floors. This place is hellishly rotten. Still better than Morgantown, though. As you go through the building, you can enter some of the rooms that you passed by earlier. Like this one. This room in particular has an optional cutscene that you can trigger. It's a flashback to the hospital with James, when Mary got her sickness diagnosed by the doctors. You can hear James grieving and yelling at the doctor, a performance that is surprisingly well done by Guy Sihi. James is devastated by the news that the illness Mary has is terminal. James asks how much time she has left, and the doctor says that she may only have three years. Three years? So that's where he got the three years from. Mary wasn't dead for three years, he just misremembered. <laughs> you know, it would be kind of funny if it wasn't so fucked up. Three years maximum is what Mary had, and she spent most of it inside of that hospital. That's supposedly where she met Laura. This probably explains why Laura is so hostile to James, because Mary would tell stories about him, waiting for him in the hospital, but he would never come. I thought Laura was just being annoying because that's just the personality of most child characters. But no, she is completely justified. She didn't lock us in that one room just because she felt like it. She genuinely does not like James for how he neglected Mary. And I get it. You know what, Laura? You're alright, kid. Sorry for trying to shoot you, but don't test my gangster. We continue to make our way down the hotel. We find ourselves back in the basement and into a room where we see... Angela and she's surrounded by flames. At first, it almost seems like Angela is in hysterics. She's seeing things, and when she sees James, she mistakes him for her mother. She thanks James for saving her earlier, but she almost wishes he didn't, since she believes that she deserved what happened to her. Despite James fighting back against that idea, Angela doesn't budge. She's completely lost in her guilt and trauma. She asks James for the knife that she gave him, Knowing what Angela would probably do to herself with it, he refuses. So, Angela just starts walking up the stairs as the flames engulf her. That's when you get probably the funniest, but also one of the hardest hitting lines in the entire game. It's hot as hell in here. You see it too. For me, it's always like this. I always wondered why the game put a subtle focus on Angela. She got the cover art, the best music, and she's the first character you encounter. But I get it now. Angela is a tragic and well-written character. I think if she had her own main story, she would be just as compelling as James. She's a fan favorite, but she's also had her own fair share of misinterpretation. People say she murdered her father, which is misleading. She killed her father in self-defense. Very important distinction. People seem to be confused as to why Angela is in Silent Hill as if she was sent here because she did something wrong. What you need to understand is that Silent Hill isn't Saw. This isn't a place you end up at because you are simply evil or morally ambiguous. This is for people with trauma hidden away and buried underneath their skin that tortures them. Just because Angela is pure compared to the rest of the characters and has done no wrong, does not mean she is safe from the pain that is rooted in her past. It's not the town punishing her. It's not some higher being punishing her. It's Angela punishing herself. Of course, this is just my interpretation, but I'm pretty confident on this one. Since the idea of Angela being punished from some higher power because she killed the man that ruined her life isn't a very nice message to send out in a video game. Unlike the other characters, Angela is innocent. James is flawed, Eddie is very flawed, but Angela did absolutely nothing wrong. She is a victim, through and through. And I guess that's what makes her story so sad. She's receiving her punishment for something that wasn't her fault. I'm sure some of you can relate. 
unfortunately. Basically, to summarize her entire character in one very insensitive joke, Angela is the final boss of I can fix her. YouTuber Calixi made a small little theory in his video that Angela, a name which is Greek for messenger of God, is Silent Hill's way of showing that some sort of higher power within the town, or within James himself, is keeping tabs on him and observing his actions. Personally, I have a slightly different take on this. I think that Angela is the town's own twisted way of sending a message to James, showing James what will happen to him if he lets all of his regrets, grief, and pain eat him alive just like how it devoured Angela, right in front of him. This is the part of the game that nears to the section where it locks you in for a particular ending, which is fitting, because this scene of Angela going up the stairs, letting her trauma consume her as she ascends, is the deciding moment for James. Is he going to let his past devour him? Or is he going to fight back and take control of himself? There's a reason why Silent Hill 2 has such longevity, and there's a reason why so many attempts to replicate it have failed, miserably. Silent Hill 2 isn't the scariest game of all time because of its monsters or its atmosphere, or even its music. It's the characters. Their regrets and trauma that build the environments that you explore are terrifying to the player because they can relate to it. Because out of all of these terrifying monsters and fears we as humans possess, the one thing that will always petrify us the most is ourselves. The definition of hell is seeing the person you could have been. Silent Hill is terrifying because it's real. The monsters are fake and the town itself is fiction, but being destroyed by your own past is something that happens. It happens so often, in fact, that they made a whole franchise about it. Team Silence really made some of the scariest games of all time, and they did it without any jump scares. Unless you run into Laura. Or Maria. I mean, god damn, why am I being startled by the only good things in this town? Here we are, the second cleanest room in India, with a wall that has nine red safe squares. There's a bunch of theories circling around this, but I'm just gonna leave it there. It's an interesting read if you look into it. We walk through the big metal door, and we arrive at the finale of this game. And this right here is one of the rawest cutscenes I have ever seen in gaming media. In a pool of questionable and sometimes laughable voice acting, you get absolutely gut-wrenching performances from both Guy Sihi and Monica Horgan. I know Guy gets a lot of shit online, especially from Redditors, but I don't care. This dude fucking nailed it. This scene alone sold me. Stop! Leave her alone! Leave us both the hell alone! Ah! Troy Baker, please retire. This is the moment where everything starts making sense. The town, the characters, the monsters, everything. Almost everything we've seen, every place we've been to, has either been a slightly altered illusion or just a complete manifestation of James's mind. That hotel we were in, when we walked out and saw the other world, that was all a facade. The Lakeview Hotel hasn't been open in years. This place has been burned down and left to decay. This is its true form dilapidated and abandoned, and we've been walking around it like it was nothing, like a madman. Most people only get this twist in retrospect, but when you realize it, it's insane. Because it makes you question how much you've seen that was fake. It makes you question the entire foundation of this game, its purpose, its goal. This is exactly why there's so many theories centering around this franchise, especially this particular entry. It explains Maria too, and how she kept dying and popping back up again. She isn't real. She's just an altered version of his wife. She's what James wanted in Mary. But this illusion punishes James, since she still lashes out at him and still has the sickness that Mary has. All of the monsters we've encountered up until this point fit into this concept as well. The nurses, the flesh lips, the bedridden monster. It's so on the nose after we discover the twist, but it's hidden so well. And when the twist happens, it just all comes together and falls into place. And now, here we are fighting our manifestations of guilt and punishment. Angela became consumed by her trauma and regrets. Eddie let his insecurities get the best of him. And James? He's all that's left now. This is him taking a stand against his past, his regrets and flaws, 
in fighting to make sure he doesn't let it consume him, so that in the end, whatever happens to him will be his choice in a clear state of mind. I was weak. That's why I needed you. I needed someone to punish me for my sins. But that's all over now. I know the truth. Now it's time to end this. The boss fight itself is about as good as it gets for Silent Hill 2. It's challenging, and dare I say, it's almost... fun. Almost. According to the map, we're actually fighting in the lobby of the hotel. I don't know why I find that interesting, and I don't know why it took me that long to realize it, but it does really put in perspective how long this place has been abandoned for, assuming this environment is even real. It seems James at this point is really towing the line between reality and delusion. Brother is losing it, or depending on how you look at it, he's actually starting to see clearly now. All right, let's kill these guys. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Green X, where the fuck did you get that? Don't worry about it. After some sick combos, we finally beat- What? I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think I just made Pyramid Head rage quit. Skill issue. Give me those eggs, bitch. Ah! Popping off right now. Two pyramid heads at the same time? God damn, James, you're more of a monster than them. Well, I, uh, uh you know what I mean. Okay, I, uh, uh, huh. uh, I guess we'll head through this door then. I don't know. Ten star rating? Here I come. Mary? What do you want, James? I, uh, I brought you some flowers. Flowers? I don't want any damn flowers. Just go home already. Mary, what are you saying? Look, I'm disgusting. I don't deserve flowers. Between the disease and the drugs, I look like a monster. Well, what are you looking at? Get the hell out of here! Leave me alone already! No use to anyone. I'll be dead soon anyway. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow. It'd be easier if they'd just kill me. But I guess the hospital's making a nice profit off me. They want to keep me alive. Are you still here? I told you to go! Are you deaf? Don't come back! James! Wait! Please don't go! Stay with me! Don't leave me alone. I didn't mean what I said. Please, James. Tell me I'll be okay. Tell me I'm not going to die. Help me. We're finally outside. Smell that fresh air. It's so clean and beautiful and... <laughs> I... I want out of this fucking town. Well, at least we finally get to see Maria! I, I mean... Mary. Holy shit, it's Mary. When will you ever stop making that mistake? Mary's dead. You killed her. Oh. I guess it's not Mary. Well, I guess that means I can continue. <clears throat> Maria! Go fuck yourself. But I can be yours. I'll be here for you forever. And I'll never yell at you, or make you feel bad. That's what you wanted. I'm different than Mary. How can you throw me away? Oh, I finally get it. Silent Hill 2. One of the most awkward breakups in history. All right, James, just tell her off so we can get out of here. No, I won't let you. You deserve to die too, James. <laughs> Ah, 
of course. Man-made horrors beyond my comprehension. This is the single most terrifying thing I have ever seen in media, and not much at all comes close. By itself, it's already frightening. You're fighting a woman strapped to a bed that hovers in the air and has this uncanny movement that sticks with 90% of the players after witnessing it. But knowing the context, it makes it so much more horrifying. You're not just fighting another monster that vaguely represents James's feelings. Now that the plot twist has happened and everything makes sense now, the game has no reason to hold back. So it just has you fight your past in the most literal form as its final boss fight. James's final obstacle, the last thing he needs to destroy so he can return to reality and end this nightmare that's torturing him. And to do that, he needs to face a manifested illusion of his dead wife and kill it. Jesus Christ. The boss fight is simple, but very effective. It's the context of what you're fighting and why you're fighting it that makes it so memorable. And when James finally defeats the monster, it falls to the ground and lays there, whimpering his name. As I just mentioned earlier, there are several different endings for this game. Six endings, specifically. I want to talk about a couple of them before we end this to give some context. The three main endings are what the new players get. Leave, In Water, and Maria. They're all great, but the ending I want to talk about is In Water. In Water is a bit more difficult to deal with. In this ending, James comes to terms with Mary's death. He realizes he can't live without her. He doesn't see the point. And the fact that he killed her destroyed the one thing that gave him purpose. It breaks him. James, unable to live with the guilt he has, gets inside of a car and then drives himself into a river, killing himself. Now we can be together. Needless to say, this ending is extremely depressing. It doesn't give you any room for grief. It just hits you like a truck and leaves you sitting there, processing what the hell just happened. It's not just sad. It's brutal. Mary tells James that he's suffered enough in this ending, but it goes right over his head. James is so overwhelmed with emotion beyond any point of normality. It's hard to put it into words, and for different people, they will have different ways of describing it. But for me, it's hatred. Pure self-hatred. In this ending, it shows James despising himself so much for what he's done that he takes it into his own hands and ends what he probably originally started when coming here. It's a very thought-provoking conclusion, despite it being so blunt. With that being said, it's not my favorite ending, and I'm sure you could probably tell. In Waters is considered the unofficial canonical ending by many fans, and this is the preferred ending of both Guy Sihi and Masahiro Ito. It is also backed by some theories in other Silent Hill entries. I've seen people even say that In Waters makes the most sense narratively speaking. I'd like to make my case. Look, I think In Waters is an amazing ending. I think it is an appropriate path that James would have taken, and it's an ending to James' story that is toyed with and hinted at throughout the game. Me? N no. I'd never kill myself. I think it's great, and the game would be worse off without it. But when it comes down to it, would I make this the canon ending for the game? The answer is no. I would not. James spends the entire game as this character who is noticeably more aware compared to everyone else. He seems to get a quicker and easier grasp of what Silent Hill is and what is happening around him and to other people. Both Eddie and Angela succumb to their trauma, and James is a witness to this. For James to learn all of this just for it to lead to the same fate as the other two characters is just, in my opinion, a little underwhelming. Especially since it leaves a couple of loose ends, the biggest one being what happens to Laura. It's not like she's a minor character, she has a chunk of the soundtrack dedicated to her. Laura isn't just an annoying little shit, 
She is James's guardian angel, his last shred of hope left by Mary. Why do you think the main theme of this game is called the theme of Laura? It's because she plays a very subtle but important part to the narrative. She is the only one who can drag James out of his nihilism and need for punishment. This is why in the leave ending, you see James walking out of Silent Hill with Laura. He has made peace with himself, and has made peace with Mary. Thus he walks away with the last trace of his wife's existence, which is Laura, a little girl that Mary had planned to adopt as her child. So, with this ending, it is assumed that James takes over as the caretaker, raising the child the best he can, not only for Laura, but also because that's what Mary would have wanted. Compare this to any of the other endings, and it's almost like they don't add up. They're all great, but if you're playing for the first time and you happen to get the In Waters ending, it's gonna feel like you missed the point of the game or something. Like, this whole section is just a very elaborate game over screen. Given, this is all just my opinion. I can understand why this is the preferred ending. I guess I just don't want the unofficial conclusion of a game which based its story around depression, guilt, and suicide, to be the one where the main character just goes through with it so suddenly. But I guess if Trent Reznor can do it with a downward spiral, then I suppose Silent Hill can too. I mean, Cry of Fear did it, and people love that game. As for the other endings, canonical rants aside, they're fucking fantastic. The Maria ending is probably even more depressing than the In Waters one, and you got two joke endings and one what-if ending. You got the what-if rebirth ending, where James collects four religious artifacts, and as he learns about the mystical side of Silent Hill, he concludes that the best course of action is to drag Mary's corpse to an island and resurrect her with his newfound cultish knowledge. Thank God Silent Hill being batshit crazy is common knowledge to you people. Otherwise, I'd be doing my damnedest to explain that this isn't a bit and that he actually does this. The ending songs, however, is what I really want to shine a light on. Every single ending has an Oscar-winning song. Overdose Delusion, Promise, The Reverse Will, and probably one of my favorites, Angels Thanatos. A song that actually gets a bit of shit from the community for slapping too fucking hard. People thought it didn't fit the sad ending of Silent Hill 2, but I think it's perfect fit. Suicide isn't always this gloomy, sad thing for some of the people who go through with it. Sometimes it's extremely bitter, sudden, and angry, and that's what this is for James. He isn't just sad, he's angry at himself, and he is making it up to his wife by wiping the last trace of himself off of the planet. And with this, Angel's Thanatos is James's anthem for self-destruction. When you look at it that way, the song makes sense, and you can start enjoying it now. So, stop bitching and start headbanging. But with all of that being said, as good as these endings are, none of them come close to the leave ending. And this is how I want to end this video. Not as an explosion of hatred and self-destruction, or the sad whimpering of letting your guilt and regrets eat you alive, but being able to forgive yourself for what you've done, and making the best of what you have left. And I'm sure a lot of us can relate to that. Mary? <coughs> James. Forgive me. I told you that I wanted to die, James. I wanted the pain to end. James tries dodging the truth, saying he simply did it just to end her suffering. But it doesn't work. It's only partly true but it's not how he felt. James admits to Mary that he hated her, that the disease had taken away his life and made him miserable on a daily basis. He lashes out and says he wanted to just be rid of her, but Mary rebuttals James, saying if that truly were the case, that he wanted her dead and gone, he wouldn't feel so guilty and he wouldn't punish himself for it. Before Mary dies, not just in physical form, but in the other world as well, disappearing, leaving nothing of herself behind for James to grasp. She leaves him her letter. The letter that we had in the beginning. This was the letter Laura was talking about. The Silent Hill letter. This wasn't an invitation, or a message to let James know she's still alive. This was a goodbye letter, just like the one she left for Laura. This is it. The letter that originally brought us to Silent Hill. The full, unaltered piece of paper. No illusions, no more tricks. This is it. 
Mary's goodbye to her husband, James. And as she passes us this letter, she utters her last words to James. Go on with your life. In my restless dreams, I see that town. Silent Hill. You promised you'd take me there again someday, but you never did. Well, I'm alone there now, in our special place, waiting for you. Waiting for you to come to see me. But you never do. And so I wait, wrapped in my cocoon of pain and loneliness. I know I've done a terrible thing to you. Something you'll never forgive me for. I wish I could change that. But I can't. I feel so pathetic and ugly laying here, waiting for you. Every day I stare up at the cracks in the ceiling, and all I can think about is how unfair it all is. The doctor came today. He told me I could go home for a short stay. It's not that I'm getting better. It's just that this may be my last chance. I think you know what I mean. Even so, I'm glad to be coming home. I've missed you terribly. But I'm afraid, James. I'm afraid you don't really want me to come home. Whenever you come see me, I can tell how hard it is on you. I don't know if you hate me or pity me, or maybe I just disgust you. I'm sorry about that. When I first learned that I was going to die, I just didn't want to accept it. I was so angry all the time, and I struck out at everyone I loved most. Especially you, James. That's why I understand if you do hate me. I want you to know this, James. I'll always love you. Even though our life together had to end like this, I still wouldn't trade it for the world. We had some wonderful years together. <laughs> Well, this letter has gone on too long, so I'll say goodbye. I told the nurse to give this to you after I'm gone. That means that as you read this, I'm already dead. I can't tell you to remember me. But I can't bear for you to forget me. These last few years since I became ill, I am so sorry for what I did to you, did to us. You've given me so much, and I haven't been able to return a single thing. 
that's why I want you to live for yourself now. Do what's best for you, James. James. You made me happy. Fuck this stupid ass game. This is some of the most genuine writing I have ever seen in a video game. I've never seen, heard, or felt something so heartfelt and honest and delivered in such a human way. It's said that the voice actress for Mary cried during the recording of this letter. And I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I cried while editing this part together. And I must have played this game like seven times just in the making of this one video. I don't know what it is. This game just builds you up and watches you collapse like Chinese infrastructure. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Fuck, this video is a mess. It picks the sweet spots when you're the most mentally exhausted when playing the game. And it hits you, and it doesn't let up. It doesn't help that I was depressed as shit when playing this game, too. Mary's crippling feelings of being a burden, a liability, mixed with James's regret and need for punishment and replacement of forgiveness, it's such a potent mix that manages to strike every single nerve that I have. And I relate to it. All of it. Except maybe the uh, killing my wife part. You know, maybe I'll get there one day. Then I'll be able to look at James and claim that he is literally me. I love this game. And that's the only way I can really end this. Out of all my years of writing and drafting, whether it be music, comedy, literature, this entire narrative has beaten me to pieces and left me speechless every retelling. And this is about as far as my literary skills reach. I love this game. That's all I'm able to say. But enough of that. Let's round, uh, let's round up the pros and cons of this game. Let's start off with the pros. Great atmosphere. Sometimes dodgy, but overall, impressive voice acting. Masterfully written narrative and twists. And the perfect soundtrack. It's some of the best you'll hear in the business. It's got it all. Lo-fi, trip-hop, indie rock, ambience, gendercore, uh, radiohead. I got this bad boy for about... $70 on Amazon, uh, which may seem like a steep price to some of you, but when you consider that this thing was about $200 before the restock, uh, yeah, that, this is a fucking steal, man. Uh, it's great, man. I think Akira did a fantastic job on this game, and uh, it's, it's a great listen if you're in the market for this sort of thing, and I think it's worth every dollar up until $200. Yeah, one of the greatest video game soundtracks of all time. I absolutely love it. 10 out of 10. Thank you, Akira, for the amazing music. This is going up here with my masterpieces alongside Alice in Chains' Dirt. Yes, I think so. Ooh, 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 what's this? Black Country New Road. Oh, I think so. You know, I think I got some Jimi Hendrix up there. Oh, shit. You know, I got Spiderland in this bitch. I think I might get death tones up there for all you white girls. Some of you guys are probably in the comments right now thinking, Green X, bro. Your selection of records is whack. Where, where's Trippy Red? <laughs> where's Ice Spice, dude? Where the fuck is Sexy Red, bitch? No one cares about this indie bullshit. Where the fuck is the little p- <laughs> Yeah, dude, cool vinyl collection, but none of this shit is trap or drill, so I can't hit my Dougie to it. I'm gonna get the real music fans in my comments saying, Dude, where's the fucking Aphex Twin, bro? <laughs> where's the fucking Radiohead? Dude, no OK Computer? Yo, fucking L, bro. The cons are, well, uh, the gameplay is kinda shit. Specifically, the controls. You could make the argument that it's meant to be difficult to control, and it adds to the horror and all of that, but, I mean, come on. Come on, be honest with yourself, this shit is ass. Some of the puzzles are retarded, but I'm still trying to figure out whether that's a con or not. I guess it's because, at the end of the day, I wouldn't be the same without that fucking wax puzzle. That shit is attached to me, just like how the letter is attached to James. The game is frustrating, but it's endearing. It's clunky and linear as hell, but it still has a ton of replay value. The voice acting is fucking horrible sometimes but it's also so genuine and memorable. 
with performances that cannot be replicated. This game is stupid as shit sometimes, but it still manages to be some of the most potent storytelling in fucking media, and basically what I'm trying to say is that this game, it's alright. Yeah. This game is alright. And I think that's the end of the video. How's that for an allegory for depression? I'm sorry for disappearing so much. You all deserve so much better. But it's for your own good. Think about it. I'm like Hershey's chocolate. If you consume too much of me, you will get sick and probably die. I read the comments though, even the hate mail, my favorite kind. And you guys and guyettes really are a bunch of sweethearts. Just know that my lack of responses and proper communication doesn't come from some fluctuated ego. It's just that I'm always sleeping. No matter how big or how small we end up, I'll always value what we have. Thank you. And that's it. Thank you for watching, everyone. And thank you, Silent Hill, for changing my life and so many others. Good night. Mary? No, you're not. Do I look like your girlfriend? No, my late wife. I can't believe it. You could be her twin. Your face, your voice, just your hair and clothes are different. My name is Maria. I don't look like a uh, ghost, do I?